Yeah, so <clears throat> this is it's a really insightful question. So I, I would start by by you know highlighting a little bit of a caveat, which is there is no organization design and there is no no kind of you know process design that's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that you can do in a company is to be nimble about these things, right? If you end up having religion on these, you'll just get stuck in bad choices and 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 you will not be able to move fast enough, right? So 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 always keep that in in your mind. I know it's maybe obvious when I say it, but people actually don't follow it. They get just too too um, calcified in their structural thinking. Um, I think the 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 it really depends on the stage of the company, whether it's high growth, whether it's scale and so on and so forth. So I'll give you a couple of examples, right? And Google, on the Google Maps team, we were pretty much at scale, we were organized as we had a data team, right? That was responsible for all of data. And then we, the end it was a horizontal team. The reason why we did that is because you wanted like all the cross kind of, uh, you, wanted, you wanted efficiencies of scale, right? You wanted to make sure that the data is organized in, a, in the same manner, it's going to the same schema, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we had a search team that was, entirely focused on the best search experience, right? And they had they were able to then draw talent from within the company and outside because everyone wanted to work on hard search problems. So that was a search team. And then we had the front end teams that were responsible for the UI and the customer journey and so on and so forth. So those front end teams were like built with like really strong and metallic product managers who understood where the, where the competition is going, where the customer is. And then they were able to draw the data and draw the search experience into it, right? And Uber, we were organized a little bit more simply. Um, in the ride sharing world, we had a rider team that was focused on everything on the rider. We had a driver team that was focused on the driver. And we had a marketplace team that basically did a lot of work in terms of connecting the riders and drivers. And then we had a bunch of platform teams like maps and safety and, uh, and machine learning and payments and so on, which was basically kind of like a, 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 a more technical team that was helping most of these teams, right? So I think the, the, the long and short of it is if you have, uh, I, I'm a big believer in, in, in mission-oriented teams. So for instance, if you have a problem to go after, so like Ankush was describing the March problem, right? So if you have a new problem to go after, it's always good to pull together a team uh, and, and really saturate resources into that and give them a charter and say, go, right? And, and, and if you do it that way, what ends up happening is, firstly, you get the best, best people sort of working on, on some of the high priority projects, but you also give them enough autonomy to just go and kind of make that happen. Provided the other caveats we talked about earlier in our conversation around technical debt, around the fit and polish, like just make sure that you have an inventory of that and you're just going and running towards it. And the other thing to avoid in that situation is almost no team, in, again, depending on the size of the company, almost no team can be successful on their own. So please map out dependencies. This is again, something that I've seen fail very badly where a team will say, oh, I've got this priority. I'm going to work towards it. And they go one week, two weeks into it. And they're like, wait a minute we don't really, we are not on the other team's roadmap. What mm. are you going to do? And then it becomes an escalation and, you know, all that stuff. And by the time already one week has gone by, two weeks have gone by, there's a meeting and, you know, all that. I mean, things just get slowed down. So when you're actually setting up the team, when I say saturate them with resources, it makes sure that that team is also getting all the dependencies worked out up front. And those other teams that they're dependent on are also prioritizing what this team needs to do. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen, right? So, this is a much more of a it's, a, it's a pretty like a long kind of complex kind of situation. But in general, I would say, you know, organize based on horizontal platform, uh, uh, horizontal platforms and kind of vertical customer teams uh, have mission oriented teams with interdependencies work out with like a single owner or maybe a couple of owners, product and engineering and design and so on. Um, and then just go hard at that problem and, and just be nimble about evolving this. That's 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 the that's the messiness of of the real world is, is kind of how things work out. Yeah, so, so let me answer the red flags question. So when I interview PMs, um, some of the things that stand out for me and I'm like, okay, I need to dig into this more. And by the way, keep in mind that interviews are also not a perfect way to hire. Like, like let's just please remember that. Like, yes, they are kind of the best way we have. But over time, you know, we have to keep on developing better interview cadence and so on. So it's not just one person's decision. Um, but I think the first thing I would say is one red flag for me is if the person is not being humble, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're coming in and saying, I did this, I did that. And I was a person who kind of drove this and all that stuff. And it wasn't really a team effort, especially as a PM. That's a huge red flag for me. There is not, you know, you, you could be an engineer and having that discussion with me. And I would actually completely believe you. Because engineers mm -hmm. build things, right? PMs basically get things built, right? So, 
So, so I just let's be clear on this, right? So, so to me, um, if a PM is coming in and saying, I did this and I led this strategy and I did, you know, it's like, okay, great. But like, okay, was this a team effort and, or you, did you do everything on your own? Right. So, so, so I think that's one red flag for me. The second is if they come in knowing everything and they're not willing to sort of engage in a discussion and be challenged, uh, that's a huge red flag because uh, typically, yes, while, while I was saying I want PMs to have broad, <clears throat> broad context and so on, they can't know everything. And it's a learning mindset that you're looking for, right? So that's the second red flag. The third is um, if they have actually never failed, that's a problem for me, right? And, you know, you can be very early on in your career. And failure doesn't mean that you like had a catastrophic failure. But like, you know, you fail in, you did something, you took a risk, uh, could be in life, could be in something, whatever. And you thought it's going to work out. It didn't work out. And you learn from it. I mean, I actually like that. And if you have never done that, I don't want you to come in and start failing for the first time on, in my company. Like, that's kind of weird because then, then I'll be like managing you because you won't know how to recover from that failure. You know, so, so I, I think I, I look for people who have had like interesting life experiences along the way. And if you haven't had one or if you are not able to talk about one, then eh, it's a little bit of a red flag for me. Um, and, and the final thing is just pure communication mm -hmm. skills. Like if a PM can't communicate clearly and can't articulate and it's not an enjoyable conversation where we are like building on each other's ideas and so on, uh, that's something I dig into a little bit more. By the way, I'm very mindful of what I just said because I know that sometimes, you know, English may not be the first language for people and I have interviewed a lot of people like that. It's the communication skills is not about you have perfect English. It's not that. Are you able to communicate your point of view and are you able to relate with somebody who's having, you know, conversation, whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face, um, and, and, and sort of build on each other's ideas? That's what I'm looking for. It's not about like you have to have perfect, like, you know, English or whichever language you interview in, right? So, so those are three or four um, softer kind of patterns that I look at uh, outside of, of course, you know, your core, core PM skills, but those are the red flags for me. I think I have a little bit of a, I don't think it just applies to people who are, people who are early versus, uh, versus later. Um, ultimately, in my view, uh, it just comes down to, is your product working, right? Like, like if, if you are working on a product and, and your product is not growing and you have a certain set of metrics and you're not meeting those metrics, what are you doing? Like, like that, that's, it should be pretty objective, right? And so that's, that's, that's where even if you're early on in your career or not early on, if you're an early PM in a startup, that was a question, you will have some understanding together with your team, your engineers, your design, your, your, your executives, whatever, that, that we are going to achieve this particular milestone and this goal. And, and, and if you're not being able to do that, then you should reflect and see like, hey, there is something I could be doing better or somebody else could be doing better. But, but ultimately it's the product. You live and die by your product, right? If your product is not doing well, it's your problem. If the product is doing well, by the way, it's the team that did it, not you. But if the product is not doing well, it's your problem, right? So, so you kind of have to like have that uh, number one. Number two, as you start growing up into an organization, there are these interesting teams that become these magnetic teams. Everybody in the company wants to work with them, right? And you want to be part of that team. You want to win, right? You want to be in, in a situation where people are like pinging you say, hey, I heard you're doing really interesting things. Can I come and join your team, right? So, so there are all these really interesting teams that get formed. And, and as a PM, you want to be in that situation. And, and you should really look at how your team is structured. And this is not about you. It's about your team and your project. You know, how is it viewed within the company? Is it viewed as a successful team? Is it viewed as a team that's kind of just okay? Or is it viewed as a, as a low performing team? Because ultimately, as a PM, you're responsible for the success of your entire team, and you have to like step in and kind of address that. Um, those are some of the early signals that I would pick up outside of the formulaic kind of performance evaluation processes and all that typically companies have. But is your product winning, and is your team winning, right? If those two things are there, I think you're doing a good job. Ritual. Uh, so we, we've had a lot of... Uh, silly rituals, uh, which haven't contributed to growth, but we used to have a shared chat anthem, or like a song we would play all the time when we hit a milestone and all of that. But I think one, if, if like I sort of think about one habit or culture which has contributed, uh, I think we, we've been uh, very obsessed with sort of sizing our bets or, or, or like having a very data-backed way of putting bets. And, and we get, we get so obsessed. So for example, like both Moj and share chat, we look at them like a marketplace, right? So if you want to predict that, should we, should we put more resources and try to increase the fashion content, let's say 
that's our bet how much resource to report and what kind of gains do we get in time spent and retention and all of that now there is no easy way if you're doing it for the first time you have no benchmarks you can't really figure out how much gains you would get so we would go to the extent that we will do a negative experiment a quarter before where we'll take away 10 percent content and we'll see the drop and that will give us a sense of the incremental 10 percent if we in increase it by 10 percent what kind of gain can we expect so i think we have this obsession about if there is a cheap experiment that you can do to build more confidence on your bet, you better do it and build that confidence and then put that in your OKR. So I think that obsession with, with being very data backed and, and sort of building confidence on your bets, a lot of the things that we do can actually be much better if we do it this way. There will definitely be a lot of bets which you can't do an A-B test on. These are like your gut based calls or strategic calls. You can't really test your way into figuring out. So, so you have a lot of unpredictable bets already on your plate. You would want to have that minimized. So a lot of your bets should be very well baked out, very well understood up a quarter prior uh, when you set your OKR for the next quarter. So I think that's one obsession that has stayed stayed with the company. And I'm proud that, that even at this scale, we're sort of obsessed about doing things this way.